Welcome to Think Tech. We are raising public awareness about energy, globalism, diversity, and technology. <laughs> this show is The Arts in Hawaii. I am your host, Donna Blanchard, proud managing director of Kumu Kuhue Theater. We're coming to you live from Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu, very close to Kumu Kuhue Theater. Today I am joined by uh, gay, uh, two authors, Gail Harada and Lisa Lynn Kanai, and we will get to them in just a moment. First, I want to let you know that we broadcast live on the internet every weekday. All of our shows are streamed on Ustream.tv and Spreaker.com. And if you would like links to our live shows or any of our archives or upcoming uh, schedule, go to thinktechhawaii.com. And if you would like to join us in the downtown studio, contact Jay at thinktechhawaii.com. I am joined by two lovely ladies who are also really thoughtful and delicate writers. Uh, Lisa Lynn Connie's short story collection, Island Linked by Ocean, uh, was public, published by Bamboo Ridge Press five years ago, and she is one of the guest editors for their upcoming 35th anniversary issue. She has, she has other works that we'll talk about as well. Um, Gail Harada's first book of poetry and prose, Beyond Green Tea and Grapefruit, was released by Bamboo Ridge late last year, and she will be reading at the Hawaii Book and Music Festival this weekend, and we'll, we'll talk a lot a bit of, uh, about the festival. Both ladies teach at um, Kapiolani Community College and are heading off at the end of the week to read in New York City. Thank you very much for being here, ladies. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. That's all I got. And I want to, before I go any further, I would like to thank um, Joy Kobayashi Citron at Bamboo Ridge Press. She helped hook me up with both of you. And she is the one who gave me that line. You're both heading off at the end of this week to New York City and didn't tell me why or what it is. So <laughs> I'm excited to hear about that, too. I, I just want to start off saying that having the two of you on the show was a really good excuse and impetus for me to spend a lot of time reading your work this past week and I have enjoyed it thoroughly. You both write, your poetry has such a, um, a, a narrative through line to it that, that keeps pulling you through and, and your short story work has such uh, graceful poetry to it, really. Oh, it's you. a nice combination to have the two of you here today. Hmm. So let's start off. I'd like to talk about um, uh, what you are working on right now, what you have available, what you're working on. Would you like to start, Gail? Well, actually, I'm not working on too much right now because I just finished this. Yeah. Um, but there, you know, I'm always thinking of poems or lines or kind of. Um, there's a story at the end of Beyond Green Tea and Grapefruit that. I want to extend into something longer. Ah, okay, excellent. So, in uh, along with your day job and everything else going on in your life, you keep the through line going. Um, periodically. Okay. More in the summer than during the semester. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And what are you going to New York for? Well, actually, we get we came back from New York, so I think when Joy talked to you, oh. it was just before we were about to leave. So we went to New York City to do two readings, one with the Asian American Writers Workshop and the other one with the Asian American Asian Studies Research Institute, oh. Asian Research Institute. They're associated with um, CUNY, with the City University of New York. Okay. Oh, and fabulous opportunity. It was fun. Yeah, we went for, we were there for spring break. Yeah. There were five women, actually. It was Juliet Kono Lee. Chrissy Passion, and Inoshita, and, and Gail and I. Oh, yeah. nice. So, did Jean, I forget? And Jean, Jean Toyama. Toyama. Oh, okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. So you had a spring break. Did you do the whole Girls Gone Wild of thing? Of course we did. Yes. <laughs> Food tours, shows. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we did the readings. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And Lisa, what are you working on now? Um, I'm currently working on a novel. Uh, but who is it? <laughs> I'm working on a novel. Um, it's a, uh, I don't want to say too much about it, but basically it's a coming of age story for a young girl who <clears throat> grows up in the Waikiki area, much the way I did, and how she uh, meets up with the wrong man and how she negotiates her way out of that. So I tend to write about uh, women characters. I, I think my, my work is really chick material 
empowering women kind of material. Yeah, it's yeah. very empowering. It's not so. chick material like Sex in the City. Bad no. decision after, <laughs> yeah, bad decision. Which is all right. It's yeah, okay that's fine. as long as it, it's strictly entertainment. You're, mm -hmm. Both of you have work that I think is very female empowering. Um, and uh, let's see. We uh, I, I asked both of you to bring pieces that that you might read for us. Um, I think if you don't mind, if we jump into that, that might be a nice jumping off point. I'd love to hear what you've chosen, where you would like to go with the work. Sure. And then, would you like to start? You, would you like me Lisa? to start? Is that yeah. Okay? <laughs> Do you want to start with a piece and then? Sure. This was a poem written. I don't know how many years ago, and it's called. Um, Look My Daughter, because I chose the, the title, actually the writing prompt for the poem was try and choose something that uh, you know you would hear often in the home and, and my mom would always sort of say you know, in an exasperated way, look my daughter. <laughs> so I took that line, this isn't my mother, but I took the line and I turned it into uh, a piece. So it's called Look My Daughter. Look my daughter's feet, this girl gonna be tall. Look my daughter's hands, the gr this girl gonna be talented. Look my daughter's smile, this girl gonna go places. Didn't mommy tell you no wear, no wear white shoes yeah. to school? Go, pu go put on one slip and hide your bra strap. And don't forget, chew your communion way for good, you know, like choke to debt. Stop staring at Sister Josepha's mustache. Stay still, sit up straight, pay attention. The Virgin Mary stay watching you. Try go look your cousin's homework, she get nothing but straight A's. Try go watch your cousin's manners, she say please and then no thank you. She cross her legs, then cover her knee with the hem of her dress, just like one lady. Why you looking me more like your cousin? Maybe your auntie right. She said you always dancing, she think you gonna be one stripper. She said you always daydreaming, she think you gonna be good for nothing. She said you pretty, pretty ugly. She think you lucky if you get one boyfriend. Auntie, every time tell me, you know your daughter, your daughter just like you. I never can be satisfied with the way things are, so I read Cosmopolitan and follow my horoscope. I go to church on Sunday just so my daughter turn out okay. I got to raise her all by myself, that's why. So I make sure for ask the Blessed Virgin, please. Now let my daughter end up with one philandering loser. Now let her settle for the first guy who act like he care. I tell you this much, my daughter not going to clean hotel rooms. She gonna marry one lawyer, one doctor someday. Look, my daughter's smile. My little girl, she gonna go places. Oh, very <laughs> nice. I love that. <clears throat> when, you, uh, when you write in Pigeon, Pigeon. Is, it, um, is there a thought process behind that? You know, the, the chain, do the thoughts come to you in Pigeon, or do they come to you in the more formal speak that you were using earlier. You know, it you know? really depends on who the character is. You know, if the character is going to be a pigeon speaker, it's really easy for that to happen. And at the same time, I, I really uh, love writing in American English as well. I don't really have a problem with that either. It really all begins with who's speaking. Yeah. Yeah. And then it just comes and out. And then it just happens that way. I went to the Pacifica writing workshop over the weekend um, at the University of Manoa, of uh, uh, Hawaii at Manoa, and um, there was a workshop on writing in Pigeon that Lee Tono Uchi oh, led, yeah. and I good didn't friend. take that one. There was so, yeah, he's a good one to do it, the, <laughs> the Pigeon Gorilla. Um, he's also written quite a few plays for mm -hmm. Kuma Kuhua. Um, and he, some, uh, it sounds to me like some writers, when they work in Pigeon, they work to, like Mark Twain did with Huckleberry Finn, make the words read so that if you read phonetically, you will have the, the accent. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. um, but, but others don't. Others just write the words. Yeah. As, yeah. Well, you know, Pigeon, it isn't standardized. But what's interesting is you have a body of work already written in Pigeon, so when you have these new writers who come along and want to write something in Pigeon, they, they sort of borrow the way a word is spelled. Mm -hmm. And in a way, sort of creating a standard, but um, there really is no standard. So yeah, you're looking f to write something that a reader can look at phonetically and decide what the word means. And then of course you have to provide enough context so that uh, the reader understands what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. But the, my first experience with reading Pigeon was Lois Ann Yamanaka. Mm, mine too. 
And oh yeah, mm -hmm. oh, I was going to ask who you were, yeah, uh, yeah who who set that example for you? Yes. Um, and I knew, I knew, I I didn't understand this word when w e n mm -hmm. because as soon as I thought I understood its usage, then it would be thrown in a sentence again in a way that, you know, I was very new to the island when I was reading uh, this as yeah. well. Um, but I knew what she was saying and what, what her intention was, and it moved me regardless of being able to speak the language mm -hmm. or not. So, do you have a daughter? <coughs> no, I don't. Hmm. <laughs> I think we have a mother. <laughs> I have a mother. <laughs> I don't have a daughter, no. <laughs> I, I always feel, um, <coughs> I, I interviewed a singer-songwriter, um, Sarah Dooley, who talked about writing a piece that really surprised her. She wrote something in her lyrics about um, if I, I don't know, if I loved you anymore, I'd have to kill you. And it really surprised her when she wrote that line. Do you um, surprise yourself with your writing? Uh, many times. Yeah. I couldn't give you a specific example. Sometimes I'm surprised at how uh, um, something will come out on the page that is probably uh, something I wouldn't like say out loud to another person so maybe you know you allow your characters to to say those to say to be as direct or as manipulative if you want to put it that way and um, I don't think I'm a very sentimental person so I don't uh, I try not to be too sentimental in the writing I think that's a that's a horrible thing for a writer to, to be in writing but Sometimes if I write something and it kind of moves me to the point where I sort of have to stop and, you know, uh, cry a little, then I know it's, uh, it's working. And that's when I, I get really surprised if, if I get kind of emotional when I'm writing something. Yeah. Oh. So when you say too sentimental, you mean uh, deep heartfelt? You know, unicorns, rainbows. Oh. <laughs> 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 I, I wouldn't accuse either of you of going there. <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about okay. that. But, um, you know, <coughs> in the same way, well, as an actor, I mm. can play a character on stage and really exercise the dark side of me without yeah. ever attaching myself mm -hmm. to that. And it's very therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah? You, you feel that coming from writing as well? Or is sometimes there's a little mm. line you don't... I think in the beginning, maybe when I started, it was it's sort of therapeutic, but... You know, as, as time went by, I wanted to concentrate more on the craft of writing along with keeping in mind that I'm not writing in a diary. I am writing for a reader. I'm writing for an audience. So I've sort of crossed that line, but that, you know, the, ther the sort of writing for the self as a, and then writing for uh, an audience. So it's therapeutic because, I got you know, you want to do it and it... it uh, you feel good after you've created something. You've used your creativity, and it's like a puzzle you have to solve when you go to write something. Um, and then it becomes fun to try and solve the puzzle because you want it to be effective, you know. So I, I sort of, it's more now for me about craft and about m making sure that the audience or the reader uh, will take something away from it, as opposed to me just pouring my guts out on paper. I just, I don't do that anymore. Ah. For for uh, for a reader, yeah. So, uh, you are, are you thinking about what the parable is for the audience? Um, I try not to do that because that's just going to mess it mess up the story. Yeah. Okay. For me, uh, I think the one thing I really want to do with my writing, the first and foremost, is to entertain. And um, if, I, if I don't, you know, it's hard enough to write something. I don't want to have to worry about uh, a particular moral or a value or, you know, proselytizing. So I just want to tell a really good story that will entertain someone and that someone can connect with. And after that happened, you know, along with that, um, I think the whole uh, theme or the whole, you know, literature teachers use the word theme or the lesson that comes out of the story, that's a given. You just have to know how to tell a good story. Yeah. yeah. Well, and different people are going to find their own lessons. You know, yeah. if, if the story's good, uh -huh. you can go back to it time and time again and the lesson is going to 
change mm -hmm. for where you are in your life at that time. And yeah. I think the beginnings yeah. of it, you know, you just want to tell a good story, but as the story develops, you recognize what maybe consciously or unconsciously you're trying to say, whether it's something political or social, you know. But I don't want to get bogged down by that because I just want to tell the story first. So, have you ever written anything and then felt like you, you went you went too, it too far? It resonates too much with you, and oh, it would reveal too much about yeah. myself. Um, no, oh. not really. Mm. Just I, wondering. Yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> think I have. There are a lot of things I probably wouldn't. Um, Exploit like <laughs> my, my husband, <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> but uh, and friends, well, not all of them, <laughs> but um, every experience is, uh, is up for grabs. Oh, yeah, it's kind of exciting, yeah, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> my life's pretty boring, so. <laughs> It's fun to write and, and you know, kind of live vicariously through your, your characters uh, and what you do. Yeah. Same goes for work on the stage. I think same goes for readers. You know, we're all exactly. enjoying that That's why that you want to be able to um, grab them. And, 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 and that's, I think that's part of your job is to, to reach them through a really good story and provide them the opportunity to enter a world that they would not have otherwise. Yeah been able to enter. <clears throat> so you have a lot of short story work that you've done and now you're working on a novel. Do you continue working on short stories in the interim? Or? You know, I, yeah, the, the problem with a novel is that it's long. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, <that's laughs> so I'm going to try to tell myself that. And I, I you know, um, I think that would, if, if I have a goal, uh, the next, it would be finishing a novel. I think I've started one several times. Several, I've probably started three. So I sort of play mind games with myself and say, no, this is like a series of short stories. Um, but every once in a while, something will happen. You know, you walk around like a writer. You're always sort of observing and listening and <clears throat> taking what you hear and writing it down. And you see a story there. So you might go off to the side and write something, but. I, you know, I, I'm a teacher. I think all, most of my, my time is spent on my job. Uh, so f I'm lucky I have the time to focus on one project. Yeah. I always feel like, you know, when I read, um, when you read a short story, you read a poem, you, you are getting to know these characters, the, the, the voices. And when they're really good, you, you miss them. You want them to continue. And you read a book like, I have read Larry McMurtry's Lonesome Dove four times because I'm so in love with Gus McRae. <laughs> you know, um, when uh, those characters that are going to last through uh, the length of an entire novel yeah. have to have so much life breathed into them and so much character that I, uh, I think, and I, I'm, I'm not a writer, but I think there would be a struggle were I to try to do this, to try to come up with a character that I would find interesting for that length of time, that yeah. I could invest that much of my heart and that much story. Well, into. I bet you love that character because while you're reading the series, you see him change. Oh, yeah. And you see how he um, handles whatever conflict comes his way. And he probably surprises you at certain moments. So I think one of the... Um, one of the most important things to keep a character as uh, engaging th throughout you know, like a novel is um, their, their arc and how they, how they change and, and to keep it fresh for your reader. I think that's one reason why we attach ourselves to certain characters. Um, we see the way they grow and we watch the way they handle a uh, um, obstacles and, and and we empathize many times with you know whatever they come across you know what would I do oh, gosh I know what that feels like you, you cheer them on you call them dummy half the time you know and and, and that's why we fall in love with these characters because they have all of the qualities that, um, that we have and I think that's but I, I bet that's what makes a character uh, 
so uh, you become attached to them because you watch how they grow and change yeah. and that's that's the author's hand you know? yeah yeah and if the author is really great then it doesn't look like uh, you know you're taking a tack in a boat or something you're just really watching a person change because of it you know and that's the story right that's the point of the story right yeah right there's something, and feel free to jump in and yeah, okay. you, <laughs> you don't okay. strike me as the sort of person who's going to butt in, but <laughs> you, you can. <laughs> um, there, uh, I spent some time learning about the uh, illiteracy problem that we have in the United States, and part of the problem is not just that there are people who cannot read enough to fill out a job uh, uh, um, application or a safety manual, but they certainly can't sit down and read a piece of literature that is going to give them that, that character to learn and grow from. Those characters shape who we are, those mm -hmm. characters that we read. I also read Gone with the Wind four times. The first time I read it, I skipped all of the war parts. That's how young I was. I'm like, I don't want to read that. And then the second time I read it, I'm like, wow, this really happened. <laughs> uh. I, I didn't, I just you know, wanted the romance part of it but um, those characters when we live we live through their experiences also and we learn what works and what doesn't and how to process things um, so when you are writing a novel you are building characters that have to be so real mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Yeah, yeah, so you're asking where they come from? Um, well, we're, we're going to take a quick break. Sure. We'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about that. And, mm -hmm. and I'd love to hear you read as well. And we'll, we'll get into more of Gail Harada. We'll be right back. This is the Arts in Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series. Stay tuned. I'm Jake Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And every Wednesday, we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now, and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas out on the table. So maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you Thing. I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Okay, it's us. every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday, four to five p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Energy we'll Wednesday. see you there. Hi, we're back and we're live. This is the Arts in Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series. I am Donna Blanchard, your host and very proud managing director of Kumukuhue Theater, which is right here downtown near the studio, the Think Tech studios in Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu. Today we are talking with two wonderful writers, um, I, uh, Lisa Lynn Kane and Gail Harada. And uh, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. We'll give you time to think about the creation of those characters. Not that you need, because sure. you, you teach the class. So um, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to switch over to Gail. And you brought something from Beyond Green Tea and Grapefruit you'd like mm -hmm. to read. I love the title, by the way, when I received oh. that from Bamboo Ridge. And uh, let's just say, uh, uh, I want to make sure I reiterate that Bamboo Ridge helped bring both of you to me. They've published your works and they're going to be um, uh, have several much uh, involvement in the Hawaii Book and Music Festival which is here downtown this weekend and we are very grateful to them. And I subscribe to Bamboo Ridge Press and love oh. getting those in the mail. And yes, okay. So uh, let's hear what you'd like to read. Would you, you would like to, anything you'd like to say before um, you start? No, actually I was trying to decide whether to read something humorous or something more serious or whether to read the title, the poem that goes with the title. It's not the title of the poem, it's the last lines of the poem. Oh. Mm. But maybe I'll just go with something light, so, well not, well, Humorous, how's that? <laughs> I know it's light. Humorous. Okay. It's never light. It's never light. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, it's called The Legacy. 
okay. and um, so I'll just read it. The Legacy. It's the beginning of rush hour on Kapiolani Boulevard in front of the Blue Dolphin Lounge across Cutter Chevrolet on Friday the 13th when the front of my car explodes or, and smoke, or maybe steam, pours out from under the hood. The service station guy I call sends a tow truck, but I can hear in his voice that he's thinking, what's this Wahine talking about exploded? Probably just one hose pulled out. Exploded? Nah, she just exaggerating. The next day he calls and says, son of a gun. It was one explosion. <laughs> Get one big hole in the radiator. One big chunk got blown out. Never seen anything like it before. Son of a gun. So I think, is it a sign? A message from my father via his silver Subaru legacy? <laughs> I feel moderately guilty, even though I did change the timing belt and I did have the CV boots replaced and I do take it once a month to full serve. This time it's going to be expensive. This time, it's going to cost big bucks. The service station guy points out, still cheaper than buying one new car. My anxious friends say, better to be safe. New cars are more reliable. The service station guy says, new cars break down all the time. My friends say, what kind of car would you get? The Toyota Echo is cute. You don't have to haggle for a Saturn. <laughs> But I think of the fact that my father's car is a Subaru legacy. A legacy. The name reverberates with meaning. Did the legacy blow up because of something I'm failing to do? Is this some kind of car bachi, an admonition? Or is it a sign that I need to let the car go? My father's silver legacy is pragmatic. With reinforced side doors and solid engineering, the car my father took fishing that he could load a kayak onto, stick a cooler into, haul fish and taco home in. Mm -hmm. When he went places with my mother, they used her sleeker Camry instead. After my father passed away, we found his legacy didn't have much resale value, so I sold my car and adopted his. It doesn't match you, my mother said, turning her critical eye on me as I fastened my seatbelt, ready to drive the legacy away from her house. It's not feminine, and it's not a very nice color. A car is not a fashion accessory, I replied, sliding the key into the ignition. It takes a month to fix a car this time. The mechanic replaces the damaged radiator, thermostat, upper hose, lower hose, bypass hose, transmission cooler hoses, hose clamps, gaskets, PCV valve, ignition wire set, and spark plugs. And while testing the car, discovers what caused the explosion. Both radiator fans are broken. The dealer has only one fan in stock for a 12-year-old Subaru Legacy and special orders another fan, which takes 21 days to arrive from Japan via California. Is this a sign, a warning? Let go the car or keep fixing it? Is it a message from my father? What would he say? He would say, it's just a car. <laughs> You're saying an awful lot in there. <laughs> You know, it, it's light and it's humorous and you use probably the only time PCV valve has been in a poem, <laughs> I would bet. <laughs> um, there's so much sweetness poured into that story. Do you actually have the a legacy? Is that real? Uh, it's real, but it finally gave out and so I have a different car. Actually what happened was the legacy got to its last legs, yeah. basically. And then my mother stopped driving, so then I got her car, the Camry. And then when she passed away, um, I drove the Camry and then it started breaking down a lot. Oh. And then I decided, oh, you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's time to get a new car. So I got my very first new car a couple years ago oh. instead of a hand-me-down. That's a big moment. <laughs> I did a lot of that. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a big moment. 
That's, uh, I really love it that you explored what those feelings that go along with yeah. the ownership of something that was your parents that's no longer, who's no longer with you. Um, and in such a lighthearted way. Did you, did you come at that piece um, and purposely lighten it up or did you come to it and recognize and realize the depth that you then massaged into it? I think I recognize the depth, but it's the, having the car blow up is what did it. Yeah. You know, when that happened and I had this week long kind of exchange with the service station guy who would call me and tell me what was wrong and, and then my friends were telling me what to buy and what to do and yeah. So I ended up keeping the car for about five more years after that. Oh, but, well, good for that legacy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it went for a long time. Do, do you feel like most, most of your pieces sound very personal to me? Um, I think the, the poetry is probably more personal than the stories. Mm. The stories are stories with little bits of personal experience and like characters that kind of creep into the stories. Yeah. Do you feel, okay, so um, uh, a lot of writers will say, particularly when you're writing fiction, you develop the, these characters um, and then their voices come out. They just start doing their speaking. And I hear these from, this from playwrights as well as um, fiction writers. When you're writing poetry that is more personal, do you feel that there's a voice that sort of pours out from the, your fingers? Or are you sculpting more? Um, I guess the there's not so much of a character's voice. Uh, periodically, it's a character's voice. But it's more, I think, um, most of the time, it's more my voice mm -hmm. and not really a character or mm -hmm. Or maybe, I, just, I guess I don't think of it as a character in the poem. It's a voice that's not necessarily mine, but probably it kind of depends on the poem. If yeah. I'm, because sometimes I write a poem that's not really in my voice, and most of the time I think the poetry is, is more something I'm thinking about. Oh, okay, gotcha. So it's more driven by, by the image or some observation or some little insight into something that happened or oh, seeing okay. something. So you're, ex you're expressing something that is coming out, si coming out of a situation yeah, more. Sometimes. And what's your process like for writing? Did you, um, how long, the, some of the poems in here, have they been around for a while? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so the book, this book has kind of grown up with you. Yeah. I mean, I have um, some stories and poems that I actually started in graduate school or oh, in college. Yeah. Oh, they, wonderful. They were not as polished back then, but it's sort of like the beginnings were then, because I had a, an idea of a story I wanted to tell, or I had a poem that I just wanted to write. and it didn't all come together immediately. Yeah. Maybe that's why there's such richness in the book, because it spans so much of mm. a life. And I think it changes, you know, when I go back, when I went back to those things later, the kind of the, the truth or the reality that I saw in it to begin with got layered with other things, other experiences. Mm -hmm. and. I think more, um, more compassion and empathy, because you know a lot of times when you're young, you're kind of judgmental, angry, and angry, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> full of hormones. Yeah, and then eventually, yeah, we smooth things out a little more and thicken the soup. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe. just add different dimensions to to it, and it's not so um, one-sided. Yeah. Uh, so, 
What is your process like when you sit down to write, when you've written these pieces? And you, and you can both answer. When you come to a piece, do you come with a specific idea, or do you come with um, a, a time? I'm going to write from this time to that time and let something flow. In general, how have you? In general, ideas swim around in my head for a while. And I think of lines, and then if I really like it, maybe I'll jot it down. But I won't write the whole thing. I just have a line or a phrase that stood out to me. Or I hear something, I hear something on the radio, a phrase, and I just like it, or a bit of information, um, and I just jot it down. So I, one of the poems in here, um, I got the title from listening to public radio. Uh, a Who's show. show? <laughs> it was, I think it was Radio Lab, and they were talking about, about mathematical concepts. And there were, they were talking about infinity being the space between two numbers, not, you know, people think of infinity as, you, you know, the thing that goes on and on forever. Yeah. But that idea that, you know, a change between two states of being or two numbers could have infinity in between. I just found that fascinating. I love Radio Lab. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> love that show. Uh -huh. oh, we're we're going to take a break. Okay. We'll, we'll come right back to that. This is the Arts in Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series. We'll be right back. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, Questions related to the environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Alalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Bye. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. Hi, we're back. This is the Arts in Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series. I am your host, Donna Blanchard, proud managing director of Kumukuhua Theater. And we are coming to you live from Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu, very near Kumukuhua Theater. Um, and we've just talked Gail into reading the <laughs> story yeah. that she just mentioned, the one that was inspired by Radiolab and how much do we love those guys. So if you would, I, we'd love to hear this. Okay. I feel a little funny reading this. Um, actually, the poem wasn't inspired by Radiolab. It's a poem that I had swimming around for a long time but had no title. And so when I heard that Radiolab mm -hmm. concept, that's, it just fit. That was the title. Oh, ah, okay. So this is in memory of Wayne Ka'umu Ali Wesley, who was a poet with wonderful work. and. When I was a poet in the schools when I first graduated, um, got out of graduate school, I observed him teaching poets in the schools. And then I didn't, I didn't, you know, know him that well, but this strange dream I had ha happened and it haunted me for years and I could never write, I could never finish the poem. Um, and then I finished it. So, infinity in the space between. It was on-the-job training for poets in the schools, tag along and watch a poet teach for a day. I tagged along and the next night he dropped by to drop something off. I don't know what made him stay until 1 a.m. just talking. Maybe my books looked like friends, the Tao Te Ching, Mao's Little Red Book, Nana Ikekumu, Fornander's Hawaiian Antiquities, stacks of contemporary American poets, poetry in translation. I don't know why he decided to tell me about Vietnam. A conscientious objector was not spared the sight of a man's intestines strung like Christmas lights in the branches of a tree, had to witness a friend accused of being Viet Cong, pushed from a helicopter, couldn't stop what was happening, still sees the look on his friend's face in those last moments. His eyes seem to gaze into the still present past. As he talked, the room filled with the news images of that time, the anti-war protests, the famous war photos, the napalm girl, 
the point blank execution of a Viet Cong guerrilla. Look at this. He pulled out his driver's license. The state pretends it can prove his identity, but this piece of plastic, these numbers are not who he is. These numbers are irrelevant to Hawaiian identity. I listened. He talked until he felt he was done. We never spoke of these things again. He published some of my poems in one of the anthologies he edited. Sometime later, he moved to the Big Island. I finished the second part of a Pitts residency he had started at Olomana Youth Correctional Facility. A few years passed, and he appeared in a dream. Shadowy figures carrying torches circled the rim of Kilauea Crater. Mm. Darkness was edged with light from their fire and the glow of lava in the distance. It was silent, and he was there. He had never appeared in a dream before, so I was surprised but not disturbed until a few days later when I turned a page in the Honolulu Star Bulletin and saw his obituary. Services for Isle activists slated at Volcano Crater. He had died two weeks after a two-car collision. Police had opened a negligent homicide investigation. Those closest to him were preparing for a funeral ceremony, quote, believed to be without precedent, with Hawaiian kupuna, or elders, selecting the best day, unquote. The light in the room sh seemed suddenly surreal. The ground shifted. The Western world had no answers. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's those list of images that just come one after the other. Yeah. It's really possible. So it, it's just sort of, I was just thinking about this for years and never finished it. Oh. And it you, just haunted me. I couldn't. And now it's in your book. Now it's in my book. <laughs> I think it's more a testament to how um, maybe what a powerful poet he was. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I can feel that. I don't oh, know yeah. his poetry, but I can feel that you were very moved by it. I, so you had worked on this for years, or it was years before you finished it. This is something that kind of fascinates me, being a theater artist. You do a piece and it's done. You ha there's no going back after the run is over. You can perfect you know, night after night through the run, but then it's pow. Um, so it kind of fascinates me. Once you're published, you're done. <laughs> you know, um, unless you, I suppose you could come back and revisit it another iteration, but um, when you come back to a piece that you worked on over a period of years, that, I, I don't know, tell me about that. That must be very moving to see, so because so much of yourself has to be in it. Did you go back and change much? Yeah, I changed um, some. And I had to actually do research because I remember reading the obituary, but I wanted to use exactly what the obituary said. So I actually went to the Hawaii State Library and found it oh. so that I could have ex exactly what it said. Yeah. Because I, you know, I thought it was important to have what the Honolulu Star Bolton actually said. To honor him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful piece. Thank you for reading yeah. that. Lisa, what about your writing process when you sit down to write? Mm -hmm. uh, as I was asking Gail, is yours, what was your answer? <clears throat> My answer would probably be it's different all the time. You either begin with uh, an image, you know, you walk around, you're always looking for things to, uh, images or phrases or people who are going to, um, inspire you to start something. That, that's how it begins, usually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Start off with a line. I always like to start off with it, some kind of action. And um, yeah, that's kind of, that's it. I think, uh, you know, we generally, we all uh, generally think in images, so um, I think it's really important for a writer to understand the power of an uh, image on paper. Like a fish and two quarters sitting next yes. to it. <laughs> uh, which is sticking with me. <laughs> well, that's Obviously. Good. Yeah. yeah, you have to read the book to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I, so let's talk about getting published, if we can. Um, yeah, it's fun. 
How did you go about <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. How, I'd like to hear from both of you, and we've got, uh -huh, we just have about five minutes left. This time mm -hmm. has flown by so quickly. Um, just a little bit about the process that you went through to become a published writer. Go ahead. I didn't have much of a process because I'm not that focused <laughs> <laughs> about publishing. Uh, I keep thinking I should be more focused, but sort of, you know, I sent things out to Bamboo Ridge and um, anthologies. I was asked to submit to some anthology, Asian American anthologies. And that's just sort of how I initially got published, just small publications. Oh, okay. And then as far as the book goes, it's basically because Daryl and Eric said it's time. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl, Lum, and Eric. Daryl, yeah. Yeah. Good for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good for them. All right, well, that's easy. Let's uh -huh. all just do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, and have talent. <laughs> and take the time over years of your life to put uh -huh. together such poignant pieces. Yeah. And what Sa same route. I um, no. I I was focused. <laughs> yeah, she's focused. <laughs> I, this is what I wanted, and so I would send manuscripts out to. Um, I started off with sort of small independent journals and looked them up, see which per, per, you know which journal had a kind of personality that fit my work, and just sent things out over the summer and started collecting the rejection letters, and that's part of the process. Oh. Part of the process is getting tough. Yeah. And um, gratefully, uh, while at UH Manoa, you know, I got to meet a lot of different uh, writers and people who, you know, have that in common, that desire to publish. And so you get into writing groups and, yeah, connected up with um, uh, Daryl and Eric. And um, basically I had like about 15 short stories years later. And they said, yeah, it was time. <laughs> <laughs> it was time. And I uh, got 10 of them put into the book. Uh. So, mm, yeah, you have to really, I think, work at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Second. Well, we have uh, Daryl and Eric uh, a lot to be grateful for. We do. Yes, we do. Um, I, I th reading, reading both of your work, I've just been on the island for about two and a half years. Oh. And to read it was moving for me as, as a human, as a woman, um, but also as someone who, your, reading your work helped me because it's so very rooted in Hawaiiana. I mean, it's so rooted in Hawaii yeah. that it helped me realize that how much a part of myself this place has become. That, that is how much of this place is in your writing. And I'm grateful to both of you. For that, that was a moving oh, experience nice for me. Thing. Kind thing to say. Oh. Um, so we just have a couple minutes left. Let's talk about the Book and Music Festival, mm. um, because this is uh, Saturday and Sunday this weekend. Uh, there are several different things going on right here downtown. Are you both reading at the event? No, Gillis. I'm Gillis. And where? In what? Um, I'll be reading at noon on Sunday. Oh, okay. And actually, um, Bamboo Ridge's um, Wing Tech Lum, who wrote the Nanjing Massacre poems, he's a Cades Award winner this year. Oh, wonderful. So he'll be reading at 2 o'clock on Saturday in the, I think, the Author's Pavilion. Probably. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So there is, and then you'll be reading it, you'll be reading it noon on at Sunday. At noon on Sunday. Sunday. And there's also going to be a flash fiction activity. That, um, Buckaloos. Yeah. Go to the Bamboo Ridge That should be fun. Yeah. That yeah. looks like it'll be fun. That's at noon on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an opportunity for writers. Uh, it's, uh, I think they'll be given a subject and some uh, impromptu mm -hmm. direction and then set loose set to loose. write. And, you know, we did a little bit of that at the writer's workshop that I went to over the weekend. I'm not a writer, but it was really to have a, such a little time, really let stuff spill out where there was no time to edit or worry what, about what it. What writer's workshop was Oh, that's right. The Pacific, okay. Yeah, Pacifica, yeah. Pacific. Mm, Pacific Writers. Yeah. yeah okay. um, 
which was fabulous. It's the first time they did that, and I hope that they continue to do so. And if I can, if Jay Fidel will release me from here on Saturday, I'll be running over and uh, <laughs> catching, catching this. And I also want to mention there's some things going on that are a little more related to Kumukuhua Theater. Also, there's a presentation of Graham Salis um, Salisbury. Um, he will be here. Uh, his novel, Under the Blood Red Sun, um, is being made into a film, and we had the films direct here not, uh, here not too long ago. And also, several of Kumukuhua's actors are involved in the film, Woka Hele and um, Dan Seki, uh, among others. There will be a panel on a new book by UH historian John Rosa called Local Story, which is about the Massey case um, and how it defined local. Um, and then there's a new book by Tom Kaufman, How Hawaii Changed America, about a pre-World War II, the pre-World War II preparations for the Pearl Harbor, um, how that went before the war uh, to ensure that Japanese Americans in Hawaii would be perceived as patriotic. There's a, mm -hmm. a lot in there. Uh, which of you had the story about the um, 442nd and going to France? Oh, I did. That was really beautiful also. That was just... Yeah. Um, I was lucky that that happened. That was very moving. I, I, and we've, we've got a wrap, but your books are available through Bamboo Ridge Press. You also have a book uh, available through... Um, Tinfish. Tinfish. Oh, yes, it's the tongue. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, um, and the Bamboo Ridge Press books you can also get via Amazon. Amazon. Yes. Yes, you can go to Amazon.com. To get information about the Book and Music Festival, go to the Hawaii Book and Music Festival.com, I think is what it is. Next week we'll have Roger Jelinek, who's the executive director oh. of the festival. Okay, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, thank ladies. You. Um, real quick, I want to say thank you to our stage manager, my, uh, Marshall Collins, production manager, Ian Davidson, who is in my ear, our communications director, Chrissy Goffigan, and to Jay Fidel, who somehow puts it all together. Thank you very much for being here, and join us next week. Check us out on thinktechhawaii.com. <laughs>